So hello everybody, my name is Akria Jamphy, I'm the founder of the British Blacklist and I'm joined with my writer Ahana Shuri Smith and we wanted to talk to you guys about uh, your perspective on the future of theatre from your eyes as black uh, artistic directors in theatre. I'll go around the room um, starting with Michael, if you could just introduce yourself with your name, the in your institution and position please. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Bufong and I am the Artistic Director of Talawa Theatre Company. My name is Bolahan Obisasan, I'm Artistic Director of Brixton House, formerly Oval House. Hi, Kwame Krema, Artistic Director of The Young Day. Hey, Lynette Linton, Artistic Director of The Bush Theatre. I'm Hannah and I'm the uh, Theatre Editor for The British Blacklist. So I would like to start this with um, a video from Selena Thompson, who unfortunately couldn't join us but she had some thoughts to share with you guys. So. My name is Selena Thompson. I'm an artist and performer based in Birmingham and the artistic director of ST Limited, the company I built to produce and tour my own work. We are a small company of three. We make performance, live art and installation and we tour internationally. We are not a national portfolio organization. We don't have a building, but we are all on payroll now. So we're not freelance. We are independent, so our place in many of these conversations is slippy, which has its pros and cons. As a company, we sat down this week and had our first producing meeting since I went on furlough, tried to gaze into a sort of series of cracked crystal balls. The plan that emerged from this meeting was very clear. In the immediate future, we're going to be focusing our energies outside of the UK, continuing to build our contacts in wider Europe, Canada, the US and Australia, because these are contexts where some governments have committed to and implemented far more substantial packets of support. And this is apparent by the emails that we're receiving, where British theatres are offering us uncertainty and £100 gigs here and there. Organisations outside of the UK are offering us tour dates. This is a state of relative privilege. I have these contacts already and can make these choices, having taken time to reflect and strategize. I'm thinking about how I might extend this because that is a part of the job of an AD, right? To look at the stability you have managed to attain with a critical eye and ask, how do I extend this? How do I spread my positionality out and center the most vulnerable? And how do I do this tangibly in ways that go beyond language? But what of my context? What of the UK? I live here, my communities are here, my mum is here, so I'm accountable to people here. Interestingly, the two British projects that I have in the pipeline are not theatre. They're with East Street Arts and Arts Admin, and both of these are organisations that support interdisciplinary work. I go to them not as a theatre maker, but as an artist, an artist that writes, that is engaged in social practice and a live artist. I bring with me resilience and flexibility and a loose, wide ranging approach to form. And I think that it's those kinds of approaches that will be the future of post lockdown theatre and all of its workers. It's the only route that I can see to surviving, to look at my skill set and say, where else can it go? Gaming, AR, VR, work that's digitally led, TV, podcasts, film, and yes, theatre, sometimes in the big buildings that we know will be prioritised, if I can get in, I hope. But the only way I can face the future with any kind of confidence or agency is if I face it as an artist and from a place of power and imagination. To me, that means with inventiveness, to be magician-like, responsive and ready to adapt and transform, to centre the needs and desires of audiences, to meet them where they are at in this time, to approach artistry as an act that at its very best is in service to those that seek to experience our work. To do this, I think I have to zoom out and look at the bigger picture. Post lockdown, to me, is an odd and optimistic term. Let's face it, we are at the beginning of this decade. I think that there will be more lockdowns and pandemics. I think there will be climate catastrophe that sees us locked down in other ways. I think Brexit will bring forth the very worst of this island. And I think that the greatest economic depression in living memory will change all our lives. And as such, it should change theatre forever. 
We simply cannot seek to make the same work in the same ways. It is to willfully ignore the reality that we will be living in. It is to concede lack of imagination and give up. If theatre does not grow, if it does not honour and protect the rights of its most vulnerable workers and centre and serve a rich, diverse palette of audiences first, at every level, an art form that was already pretty wobbly, if we are honest, will die. And people won't miss it. If it cannot adapt, cannot look at itself with criticality and a spirit of possibility, humility and radical openness, perhaps it deserves to. I cannot be at this talk, I'm sorry, uh, because I'm at a workshop thinking gently with a room full of people in Spain, Israel, Switzerland and the UK about how I might explore abolition, transformative justice and radical visions of the future on stage. For all my pragmatism, I still dream in live encounters and this moment is a call to imagination if it will take it as such. The current global uprising spearheaded by Black Lives Matter, the reality of who lives and dies in a pandemic, the stark reality of how the ways in which we work have failed those with disabilities. These are all calls to action that seek to end this world and remake it. And theatre can be a rich place to demonstrate this if we are only brave enough, honest enough and transparent enough to fight to retain the best of it and reject the very worst of it overwork, top-down structures, inequity, and cultures that foster the very imbalance we claim to stand against. How might we make it so that when the youth, the most vulnerable amongst us with the least to lose, take to the streets to fight, to remake this world for all of us, know that artists stand with them and that we are writing, dreaming, destroying and rebuilding with them. And that's my provocation. Um, I want to apologise again for the fact that I can't be there um, and I want to send love and respect to um, the group of ADs that are there. Um, I know firsthand um, how hard all of you are working, the difficult decisions that you're all making day in, day out um, and I send love and I hope that you are well. You guys, you. I mean... Selena says some really um, interesting things in her comments, um, in her propagation as you described it. But we wanted to kind of, the first question we were kind of wanted to ask was your own personal uh, reactions to the closures of um, theatres around the UK? Well, I can certainly talk to what it felt like when we had to break it to our cast who were two days away from opening the show that we're going to have to, we're going to have to postpone. I think that, that was an absolute feeling of devastation. Um, it was a, a group of theatre makers who've been working and trying to pull this together for a couple of years now. We were going to launch it in our new space in Croydon. So when the news came that we actually, you know, the country's heading into lockdown, I've got to say the feeling was devastation. And of course, that then rolls out from outside of my office, my rehearsal room, out into, you know, the rest of the, the theatre world as we, as we start to talk to each other about what's going on and what's what's the way forward and what are we all doing or what all our plans are. I I, I echo the devastation. I, I never forget the day because obviously uh, we, the public were told to not go to theatre the week before the official lockdown happened. So I'll never forget the day the, that Monday morning standing in the British office talking to the team and being like, all right, we're going to continue as normal as much as we can. Um, high we had two shows on the high table and collapsible and we were like okay so we and they were both running until the end of the week and then they finished and so we were like we're going to try and get to the end of the week and da, 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 da. and we spoke about that on the Monday morning and then by whatever time Boris uh, the announcement came I think it was about five o'clock it, it had all shifted and so I'll just echo what Michael said, standing in the auditorium and talking to two casts who thought they who had come in and were ready to get on the stage um, and telling them that the shows were done um, was a moment I'll never forget. Um, and devastation is the only word I've got right now to describe how that felt. Um, and, not, and also then my mind, obviously, not understanding how long this was going to go on for. Um, just to echo what Michael said, it was, it was a really, really, I'll never, you know, when you've got those days in your life, you'll never forget. That was, that was, that was one of those days. And um, Bollock, you'd stepped into, it was, it had your role taken, had you started your new role? 
no so I, I was kind of appointed in January and um, I was due to start in April so I started work and you know in my new role as artistic director um, during lockdown so essentially met um, the current team of staff on zoom uh, <laughs> and <clears throat> and obviously because we don't um, we're in the middle of a construction um, the construction site sort of grounded to a halt which you know obviously had its own sort of implications on the kind of projected timeline of the finish of the build and um, has meant that you know we have to kind of re-strategize as much as also um, look at um, financially where we are as much as also what are the most sort of imperative actions to um, take um, for the building as much as also the kind of uh, nuances of um, you know people's kind of um, roles um, within a, you know a very small team already um, I guess fortunately for us we had sort of streamlined what you know our activities so we didn't necessarily have any any sort of productions or shows on um, but we did have a couple of community projects that could kind of um, be transposed to um, Zoom and stuff and those sort of things um, continued but for the most part it's, it was just quite um, you know uh, bewildering and a little bit uh, you know uh, challenging to sort of navigate um, forming relationships and, and bonds and you know uh, kind of developing an understanding of people's sort of personalities and, and, and work behaviours over over Zoom and stuff like that. And yeah, stepping into a new job and kind of like having to be the Prime Minister of managing a war uh, at quite a time <laughs> type of thing. So it's quite interesting um, and pressure, I can imagine. Kwame, what would you add to this, your reaction? Thank you very much, <laughs> to, be, to, to, to be honest. Uh, and, and this may say a lot about me, uh, and, and, and probably not in a good way, um, but actually I don't remember very much about it. Um, I, 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 my brain tends to uh, deal with the emergency directly ahead mm. and, and, um, and then start thinking about tomorrow. Um, in a kind of way, I, 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 I often eject things that, um, that, so it, but it was funny, it wasn't until actually Lynette said that, that I went, oh yeah, I was due to go and see a show on the Monday at your theatre. And, um, and, and so I, I went, oh, I remember that. Uh, and of course, you know, but I, I don't remember it um, in devastating terms. I don't, I, and possibly because I'm, I'm so long in the tooth, I'm so old, that I've lived through, uh, a couple of these before and I've lived through the National Guard being called out and curfews happening in, in Baltimore and seeing tanks on the street. Um, and so in a, in a way, whereas um, uh, much like there, actually, very interestingly, when that happened at the death of Freddie Gray, um, I was the only person among my staff, and of course I was the, the leader, but that had lived through any kind of riot or uprising. Um, which is bizarre because we often just think about America fill up, full up with Rias riot, full up. And actually, they, they, no one had lived through it. So when everybody was freaking out, I was a bit like, oh, look, I, I, I know this. I don't know tanks on the street. I don't know helicopters above. And I don't know, do you know what I mean? And prisoners in the prison next door screaming. Well, you know, it was, it, but it was, um, but, but I, I kind of went, okay. And so when this happened, I kind of went into the, okay. Let's 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 plan three stages ahead of. Um, so within the first week, I went down with COVID. Um, but within the first week, I I planned in my mind what we were going to do in the three stages of lockdown. Stage one: How do we stem the build the bleeding? Stage two: How do we stand on our feet again? Stage three: What do we look like when we're running? And what we, support we would need from um, our statutory bodies in order to do that. And I'm really pleased that I took the first week to plan up to 24 in my brain to kind of go, because then when I got COVID and then when it all got really mad and crazy, I'd already had my game plan, which, 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 um, which 
which has served me in that way. Hannah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so in the uh, video, uh, Selena was talking about this, this potential necessity to transfer to digital media as a result of lockdown. And I mean, that got me thinking about the stuff that uh, Brixton House has been putting out, the archived performances, and then the Bush Theatre has been actually creating new pieces of theatre during lockdown. Um, so I just kind of wanted to ask, at what point during lockdown did you decide to make this transfer, the transferal to, the, to making stuff online? I guess yeah, it was an easy it it was an easy call for us just because um, to a certain extent we saw examples of it happening around us and for the most part um, some of those um, often weren't necessarily very diverse and what we were sort of aware of was you know the fact that we had a relationship with um, Liva who were this kind of three. Um, 60 sort of archive platform and who'd recorded shows and um, past shows at the Oval House and you know it was just a case of getting in contact with them and um, assessing which <clears throat> of those archive um, shows um, perhaps you know had the sort of quality that meant that people can access it or uh, you know the experience wouldn't necessarily um, feel somewhat uh, underserving of the art that the artists had made and and in some of those cases you know um, uh, those artists were you know um, independent artists and freelancers who were sort of trying to navigate a new world and a new landscape that perhaps wasn't necessarily factoring their sort of narratives and, and their sort of importance and their lives and contributions in that. So, you know, it felt like a really um, helpful alternative um, focus um, for us to kind of offer that as, uh, as uh, uh, you know, a different um, narrative to other sort of larger theatres with big, you know, cast sort of productions and stuff so you know it took it took a few weeks and you know obviously to a certain extent you still have to um, frame it for our audiences and followers to kind of understand what what they're going to be watching what they're going to be receiving how long for and stuff like that as much as also speaking to the artists to get their consent um, to you know make sure they um, felt comfortable with the work that we were releasing as well so you know it it just felt like the right thing to do as much as also obviously maintain you know our sort of um, visibility and 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 that sort of level of care for our social artists as much as also our audiences who you know would appreciate a different offering so to speak going off that thing about representing specific experiences in comparison maybe to the more mainstream theatre showings of the National Theatre at Home and stuff like that, I wanted to draw attention to the Bush Theatre's The Protest, uh, Black Lives Matter. And what, what was the process behind um, like directing and writing and putting together all of that during lockdown? That that well can I answer just a bit before and then get into the protest because we were I think I think just to back to just talk about what um Bolham was saying we decided not to put out archived shows um and that was because our response was to make new work so along the protest which happened later the first thing we did was the Monday monologues which was um engaging our writers and some actors and I directed a few of them and other directors to, because we were like let's make work that's what we do and actually after the sort of initial devastation of that my my response is always our response at the bush is always to make work so that's the first thing that we did um looking back on it now um i don't know <laughs> is that weird thing after what kwame said about you can't remember it i actually can't remember the week after lockdown i can remember the day but i can't remember the week after but i know that the response from the bush was let's make work um particularly about the protest 
that came out of um, again the thing at the bushes. Let's make work. Let's talk to artists. Let's see what they need, they want, and they need to say. Um, and that project came out of um, a conversation with um, our associate director Daniel Bailey about what can we do and what do we <laughs> like. What what does the bush do? How do we feel as individuals in this conversation? And where does the bush sit in that conversation? So there was a kind of it came out of we put a, we put a statement out. Um, and then that came out, the work came out of the sort of the statement as well. It was like a, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Oh my gosh, words are gone. It was like a, it was like a, a couple of responses. It wasn't just once one response. And so Dan curated that project and led that project amazingly um, and was like, we need to respond in the way we do, which is art. And that was it. So it was in that, those two weeks of like initial devastation and just not being able to think straight for me, I can only talk about myself, um, art always helps me to see through writing something down, responding, and we also felt the real, real, real loss of the fact we didn't have our building, as because the bush is such a community space, and I kept going on and on and on about the fact that right now what we would do is open the building, we'd hold some sort of thing together, we'd invite people in, and we couldn't do that, and so what can we do is make work. And so Dan uh, curated the protest, got some artists together, we spent a lot of time with those artists and, and um, the work came out of that as a sort of way of responding in a way that we couldn't, which is getting everybody together. How do you feel about the digitalization of theatre? <laughs> and how does it, <laughs> you know, it's a big question, but um, it's just really weird because even myself as a platform, we have our category screen, stage, literature and sound. And there's a clear def definition and boundary between stage and screen. But even before lockdown, there's this, move to screening performances in cinemas to reach wider audiences or grabbing the attention of audiences that wouldn't necessarily enter through the doors of a theatre. But how do you feel about the, your productions being seen as potential screen projects as well or having to add that extra consideration? I'll ask Kwame and Michael about that. But Michael first, please. I'll answer this by saying uh, in kind of three parts, mm -hmm. because I've always kind of, you know, thought, yeah, you know, digital captures of theatre shows. Mm, okay, okay. Mm. One time, I think, it was a few years ago, I was in Newcastle. I had to go up there for a meeting. I, and I wanted to see uh, Papa Isidou do Hamlet. And I couldn't get there. I just couldn't get there, and I, no matter how. And randomly, randomly, it happened to be showing in a cinema in Newcastle on the night I had to do an overnight stay. Mm. So I bought my ticket, you know, sat in this cinema in, in, uh, in Newcastle, and loved this production. Just thought, wow, look at Papa Man. If you're gonna do Hamlet, that's how to do it. That's how I would have wanted to do it. And I thought, that's, wow. So I loved that happening. I also felt incredibly jealous because I wanted to be there. So that was quite interesting. So it's not necessarily that one negates the other. Because I really felt like it's great sitting in the cinema. I'm, I, I, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have seen something that I couldn't physically be at. But I was also jealous because I wanted to be there and watch it live. Uh, so that's so that's how I feel about that. Uh, subsequently, you know, we've done we've had a digital capture of one of our shows. It's done very well and looks looked great. And so I'm very happy and proud about that that kind of uh, King Lear that we did. That's great. As we kind of eased into this kind of pandemic, and we got into lockdown, and there was like, let's go digital, let's go digital, everyone, let's go digital. And I went, I don't know. I don't know if that's what I really want to do. I don't know if I'm me, you know, and tell what the moment is set up for digital. It was my first reaction, you know. Um, and then there was some stuff coming out and I thought, yeah, it, it looks great. At first I was slightly averse to the monologue digital. I thought, because that's all we can do. We can only put in these boxes. But then as it went on, I saw the boxes getting more and more creative, which I thought was quite interesting, you know. And what's apparent is there's an ap absolute appetite out there for the work that's being created digitally now, you know, I'm seeing stuff that are of course putting on, you know, being sold out. Lungs, I saw something ridiculous. Now we don't all have the kind of um, assets that the NT have. I mean, one man, two governors was like stupid amount of people watched and donate, but that asset, you know, it's, it's amazing. Not all of us have that. We don't have, you know, all those kind of assets, but there's something about the digital platform that is very interesting. Because I think, because Selena says the theatre is dying out, I'm not sure that it will. I think we have a human need to get together and tell stories, however we get together. Um, maybe it's a digital platform, maybe the digital platform leads to the real life platform. 
at the moment we are doing um, something called tales from the tales from the front line so we're kind of getting experiences from black key and frontline workers and we're going to put that together with other artists to try and make something that essentially in its first iteration lives here online and then ultimately what i'd like to do is bring it when we get back into our spaces into the real you know into a real environment into our studio i'm looking forward to the day when the frontline and key uh, workers whose stories we're telling are in the audience watching their stories being told and i think that's one of those things in, you know in terms of um, what's happened during the pandemic because at first it was a bit like, hold on, for me, I was I needed a bit of time to think about what am I going to do? What's the best way forward? Um, and then we started working on how do we serve the community, serve artists, make work. And I think that that tales kind of ticked a lot of boxes for us. It enabled us to engage with our community and get our stories told. And it's going to enable us to employ artists to tell those stories and to interact with it. Um, and then, you know, it will be a piece of work, as I said, that will be first in this iteration online. And then hopefully I'm moving it to um, to a real life theatre once we understand the nature of this pandemic, understand what the government's doing, what the guidelines are, where, where we are, you know. And that changes almost on a daily basis, as I've seen literally about an hour before I came on. That is it, the first of August now, <laughs> where we're all allowed to do indoor indoor work. I'm like, what what is happening? Is someone is <laughs> am I missing all the emails? Because I don't seem to. Have I don't seem to have got the emails where the, the situation, like the, the actual pandemic has changed. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just interesting to see how that pans out. But that's, that's ultimately, uh, yeah, what I'd like to do. So the digital and, uh, yeah, real life. It's, uh, yeah, it might be the, the way forward, certainly. Um, Kwame, I extend the same question to you. And with an extra thought about, does that then mean that you have to have a film set ready to go? I mean, a film crew ready to go alongside the, the theatre crew as well when you're putting on a production? Is that an extra consideration and that then lends into costs and stuff? I'll answer it backwards. I think there will not be a board in the country who will not expect from their artistic director to deeply embed the camera stroke digital in every aspect of production. Will that be an added expense? It is much like projection is, much like lights were, when when lights were first invented it's it's a you know etc 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 so um, i i i think um how imaginatively we embed the camera stroke digital into um into our organizations um is going to be is where art meets commerce um and so uh, and, and all, even art meets protection i agree with selena and, and and all of my colleagues here that you know i i, I deeply expect there to be several other lockdowns in the, and I don't just mean um, whether we get a second wave, I just mean we're gonna, there are gonna be other lockdowns um, within the next, uh, certainly within the next 10 years. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm actually thinking about how to play with uh, not just deeply embedded camera stroke digital in, in our rehearsal or in our product period, but in, in the role that XR is going to play in terms terms of access um, and participation because I think we're talking a lot about just access seeing it and uh, and the thing about being in a room is um, you know is, is going to church right I can pray by myself but when I hear other people praying alongside me the Holy Spirit hits me in a different way um, depending on what in whatever form of prayer you do that and sometimes my prayer from the church hall to the dance hall so um, you know in <laughs> In, in, in whatever way that we do that. So that, that, that's number one. Um, I, I've been doing, for many years, um, I used to, maybe about 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago, 17 years ago, um, and forgive this sounding grand, I've spent 10 minutes during while I was speaking, trying to find a way to not make this sound grand. And then I went, I just won't say it. And then, cause it won't sound grand, but fuck it, I'm gonna say it. And, and you can, and, and you know, read my heart. Is, would be my my um, parenthesis around my sentence. I, I was very fortunate and privileged to be in a position where um, I would work in New York quite often, and uh, from about two thousand and four, um, and and I would and I would also fly to New York often just to go to the Lincoln Center, where they had a video library of plays that had been on Broadway and recorded um, with three with multi cameras, and and they, I mean I saw. 
Angela, um, what's her name? Oh, oh, uh, I was going to say Angela Davis. It's all political. Um, That's it. Yeah, Angela Bassett. I saw her in a Hamlet from the 1980s. I saw George C. Wolfe's plays. Um, I would never have seen them um, in, in, in that way. And I would only have to read them through the lens invariably of white critics. And that meant that I found, and I don't trust the white world view when it comes to analyzing our place and so therefore actually it was worth saving up to fly to not just read what someone had said about it and as we know part of our part of what our struggle is invariably is that we are trying to fit afrocentric narratives onto a eurocentric stage which means that it is often misunderstood um, um, as you try to put that square that circle um, and so i would fly and i would go and see it and i tell you it just made me uh it just, it just gave me a, a different uh, take on the work that had gone before me. And so in my work as an artistic director from the festival in Senegal through to the Young Vic, I, um, I, I always would, uh, would use what I call or create digital byproducts, whether that's monologues, whether that's rapid response theater, going to the spots where black men had been killed by uh, the rise of, 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 of overt racism in the United States um, on, the, on the way up to, to the election of Trump. Um, I always believed in that and I always did it. I arrived here and I did My England, of which Lynette actually um, was a wonderful contributor. And in fact, th that contribution that Lynette made um, actually did the very thing that, that, that we wanted it to do, was actually it poked to people so much that people did their own cut of it and spread it throughout the far right. And our building got under siege by the far right um, because uh, they were they had they had cut Lynette's digital asset and put it out there. I can't tell you how many scandals I've had and how many what you call it. All of us have as ads man. People think yeah man, it's it's great, but every day it's another thing. Anyway, that's the long way round of saying when this lockdown came, I did not want to create digital assets. Um, I didn't have in the um, in the Young Vic sufficient um, well recorded. Um, archives that I wanted to put out there and every idea that I thought about in terms of um, in terms of digital just felt like it's something that I'd been doing for the last 10 years and wasn't inventive enough and so um, I loved seeing the explosion of work on there and it's great and it's brilliant I just made the decision to conserve my energy um, as the Chinese say sometimes when the wind is blowing in your direction sometimes just lie down keep your finger up in the air, wait till the wind turns, and then you'll have the wind in your back, not to your face. That was a philosophy I tried to apply. So interesting, because I think I was gonna say that and didn't, was the reason we didn't put stuff out was because we didn't feel exactly the same reason as Kwame. And I think I've had a sort of opposite journey to Kwame because we don't, we, we do digital stuff, we do videos, but we, we, we do, we've really focused on the live performance. and and community work, you know, that's the thing that the Bush exists to do. So we've done, I feel like I've done so much learning now about how are we archiving our work, what, you know, and the quality of that and what we, how we're using digital. So I feel in like the last 600 years that this has been going on, my mind has now gone, oh, digital, not that I was ignoring it, but now I'm much more like, yo, we really need to invest in this. And, and particularly in terms of archiving our work, because when we, well, I think someone mentioned, about you know what that was being released what was being released and what wasn't being released and and how had it been documented so i mean i wasn't aware of this either that, that there's potential for theaters to reopen and doors on the first of august but looking towards um reopening uh, obviously the royal exchange announced at the beginning of the month unfortunately that they have had to make 65 percent of their roles redundant and as much as the government has announced um, this kind of 1.5 billion lifeline, I think there's kind of worry about where exactly that money is going, if it's just going to be going towards the big institutions like the National again. So, I mean, what, what do you think about the future of the theatre industry for, for these smaller theatres, for these regional theatres? And I think particularly for this next generation of theatre makers, how... I mean, for me personally, the scepticism about whether it is um, the best industry to go into at this point, or if it's smarter to be, be going into TV and film. So, yeah, I mean, any thoughts on that? Well, if you go, if you could go first. 
Me. Yeah. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know what though? Um, it's th that's a tricky one because I think uh, to a certain extent it's a scramble right now. It's a scramble to be invisible. Um, and to uh, emphasize your importance, um, especially to the community as much as also um, knowing that for, for the most part, the iterations of the guidelines of, you know, COVID as much as also um, uh, what, what, other, what other contexts can performers live is what I think we're all trying to grapple with. And it's, it's, I think it's encouraging that, you know, um, the government wants to take um, risk with people's lives to open, you know, the London Palladium and, um, you know, encourage um, social distance or performances and stuff like that. And, you know, perhaps there'll be only a certain demographic of people that will be attending some of those um, sort of uh, productions and things like that. But, you know, for s smaller venues, they, we will have to, you know, be a, a bit more inventive and try to innovate new ways or n new environments that take into consideration the interaction and the care as much as also um, the, the need to commune with the people that, you know, we, we serve. Um, so, for yeah i think i think it's 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 a difficult landscape and it's just a case of trying to look at how you know financially we can afford it as much as also where those where those ideas feel as if they're intrinsically about um people and 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 preserving the the legacy as much as also the importance of smaller organizations as well especially from the financial aspects because of Oh, maybe I'll just add on to them that um, open letter. I don't know who of you signed the open letter that, you know, called on the government to not forget that COVID-19 crisis threatens all aspects of the theatre ecology, but catalyzed by the revelations of the racial disparity in the health crisis, this group of Black, Asian and ethnically diverse artistic leaders call on the government and the sector to ensure the progress we have collectively made does not fall by the wayside. And I guess your guys' reaction to that and how that affects, I guess you guys are not just black artists, just artistic directors of black plays. However, um, this disproportionately affects black theatre makers, right? So how, 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 how does this, how is this combated? The Royal Exchange, um, I think they're entering into consultation about 65%. It doesn't mean that they have made it yet. Um, uh, they may well possibly that, but, uh, but, and please forgive me, I, I always like to test the veracity of facts as they move into the, uh, into the ether. Um, um, and, and, and so I may be wrong. Um, so someone on, else on this line might be able to say to me, uh, no, they have actually instituted it. But my understanding is that they're in the consultation period of that. Uh, number two, I, I, and, and I know this is not necessarily what you meant, uh, and forgive me for answering it in this way, that um, I think somewhere like the Royal Exchange, their budget is 10 million. So I don't know that we can conflate them into smaller organisations, because um, that's one of the largest portfolios, uh, certainly regional portfolios um, in, in the country. And, and overjoyed that that's run in part by Roy. Um, sad that, uh, that their first season is, is is how to negotiate with COVID. Um, I, I would say that the uh, recent announcement of August the 1st um, should be read, uh, not should be, there's no should, can be read, um, as hand in hand with the financial package. The financial package of 1.57 billion um, is set up to get theatres through to, um, to April of next year, bearing in mind that our model may not allow us to do a mouse trap and open with uh, social distancing. Um, and, so, uh, and so in a kind of way, these two things run concurrent. And also at this moment in time, it is still contingent on the results of the tests that are the pilots that are being commissioned now to, to go forward. 
And forgive me being specific about all of this, but we live in a world where we can, and not in, in no way am I attacking you, but we live in a world where we can move really, facts are thrown at us so quickly. And we're living in a Twitter world where we're literally just having to read headlines and then create um, opinions from headlines because we don't have enough time to go into the detail and the devil lies in the detail. And so to go into that detail just a little bit further and cut me off, please, anyone, when I'm going too far or too long and boring, um, that there is a moment at, at this moment, there is an understanding, though not a directive, that the highest um, award from the 1.5 billion will be a million pounds um, across the board. Um, and so that would include the National and that would include the Royal Opera House and et cetera. And that anything that they need above that, where they will have to apply for the loan that's being offered over 15 years. That has not yet been decided. That has been discussed and muted by an advisor to number 10. And the ministers and the treasury are aware that that, uh, from a large organization's perspective um, is, is insufficient. That will not do it. There are 20 organizations that have lost up to 148 million um, up to this point. So 1 million will not do it. But for smaller organizations, if the big organizations get capped at a million, what the fuck am I gonna get the young Vic? <laughs> 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 I mean, and so there, there, there is a rather selfish argument which, um, which says, uh, you know, that that's something that we should gently and as persuasively push back against as humanly possible. So I would say that everything is in flux at the moment. There is no real determinations. We, they have not yet selected the chair of the board of the external panel that will sit with the Arts Council to work out quite how that money gets distributed. So we don't know this yet. So it's very difficult to make shouts about what tomorrow will look like. What we do know is that the hope is that there will be enough in the financial package for those of us who cannot open um, using social distancing of one meter plus, that there will be enough in, our, in the package that we will receive that will get us between now and April when hopefully we can open without any social distancing. Also, however, in that, in that new press release, they've spoken about by November, they're hoping to, that if the R and the P rate doesn't go up, but by November, they will possibly reduce all social distancing. So that will also have, another, have an adverse effect on our planning. To so the last part of your question, um, or really it was the first part of your question because I'm working backwards. <laughs> is this the time to come into theatre? When as an artistic director, um, I, I, I think that um, I say absolutely not. I say to young people, you should not be going into one thing anyway. That should you be a content maker and a content creator who creates in whatever platform the genre of work um, that you're creating best fits, Absolutely, yes, you cannot afford to do one job for life. Everybody in this school who's a theatre artist or just a theatre artist, now we're some archaic motherfuckers because that shit don't exist no more. <laughs> it, just, it, just does, it just don't, it don't exist. It certainly doesn't exist in the, in the realms of, 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 of anyone who's not yet a multi-millionaire who can just sit back and just choose to do it. I, I don't know about any of my other colleagues, but I'm not there. So I know man's, is, man's, is, man's got to keep hustling, you know? So uh, even though it, it can be perceived as, um, as a negative question, as this probably isn't the time to come to theatre, I spin that on his head. I go, this is the time to be everything, to be the anti-disciplinary artist that you are born to be. And finally, I would say um, the, the letter, um, was delivered at a moment in time when many of us felt that the representations being made to government did not in sufficiently include diversity as a core element. And, uh, and so um, it, 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 you know, it was deemed necessary to highlight that so that it could, um, so it could be discussed in public. Uh, Michael, I'll come to you on the back of what Kwame said. Just a year uh, agreeing with yeah, everything that Kwame's saying, absolutely. I would like to add, though, it is also, like you say, it's a time to be the kind of, you know, multidisciplinary, because one of the things that we've been also looking at is just 
you know, uh, developing ideas. We are still looking about what, what is it going to be on the other side? What do you want to make? How are you going to make it? So those conversations are definitely still happening. In terms of uh, packages, pack, government packages and, you know, the 1.57 billion, absolutely, absolutely. It's going to be an absolute bun fight out there. Mm. Um, and will it's going to, is it going to get down to us? We have to just, yeah, make noise and hope that it does. It's got to. Because I, part of me thinks that we've got to be the, like the new centre because the old centre has effectively fallen apart. I think if you're going to, you know, take all that money and put it back into where it was before, that's pointless. Because also, I think, effectively, and what I, look, I think a lot of these organisations have found is that those audiences were literally dying. They were always constantly having to look for the new, and this is the time for the new. Just on a practical level, when you think about who, you know, kind of age range COVID effects, I think it is time for that kind of real reset. And it's time for to sit down and think, right, what are we going to make when we get out? Or how, how do we use a platform, like I said earlier on? You know, we're thinking about making work in, in this platform so that we can, with an eye, to put it on in real space as well. So all those things, I'm, I'm saying, yes, have it on the point. It's, it's not a time artistically to be going, on. Oh, nothing's happening, let's sit down. That's not where we're at. I don't think so at all. I think there's still a lot of stuff been talked about out there and a lot of people are thinking about you know how we're going to make stuff and the sheer inventiveness of us just as artists is incredible you know it's it's quite um yeah it's quite astonishing to, to kind of watch it so um yeah just coming off the back of what Kwame said all of the above we got yeah shout loud reset with us in the middle you know that's <laughs> what real I'm talk, though, real talk we've always been the center that's the thing yeah. that's the madness when whenever do you know what I mean? Organisations are, are looking for someone to go on ends. Who are they going to call? It's always us. So, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Right? Looking to go on ends. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, I, I just wanted to just echo, you know, just on the question about is this the time, particularly when young people are thinking about getting into theatre, echo everything that everyone said. Obviously, let's not, let's not lie. Financially, this is, this is the, the industry as a thing anyway, financially. There's loads of questions, there's loads of structures that need to change, there's loads of conversations about pay before COVID in the theatre industry. And so, you know, from a perspective, as Kwame said, like, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a career that's moving all the time when, it, when we talk about money. But from an artistic perspective, so I'm not, and I'm not dismissing that as a thing, because that's a huge thing and that needs to always be part of the conversation. From an artistic perspective, we've spoken, and Selena spoke a lot about it in her video about change and how we're coming back. And someone mentioned about this post COVID, like post COVID world and how we're moving forward. Michael, you've just used the word reset. All these words are really interesting about, you know, this financials aside just for a second, because, you know, we, that's, that's the thing that we focus on so much. And we're like, ah, oh, just for a second, artistically, as you said, the work that's coming through is amazing. And artistically, this is the time where, like, I, I, we're, we're looking at the, at the bush, we're looking at this slightly differently because we're smaller um, and our, our model's slightly different from other people. We are looking to open the building in the next month, in, in the next month for the community. So we won't be a theatre in the way that we are, but we will be doing community work and inviting our community of Shepherds Bush back into the building. And that's where I feel like, as, an, as a building, we're going to learn so much about what, as a building, we're supposed to be doing, but also as an artistic organisation, because that needs to feed in, and the reset will come from that. Do you know what I mean? And so the artistic, um, the artistic and the art and the community and all of those words that we use, reset, I'm, I'm kind of babbling here, but I actually think this is a moment where we will see change. It's going to, and this is the time for, if you're like, yo, this needs to change, please, the, the voices are important. This is the time that we need to be voicing that. I'm going to say this, um, you know, Lynette and I are as close as, it can, as we can be. Um, I'm magnificently impressed by her mind, her spirit and all of the work that she does, has done and will do. This is not a disagreement with what Lynette was saying or actually what Stelina was saying, just to qualify, but it is, it, it, it is where I am today. Don't know about tomorrow. But I hear a lot about burning down, starting again, blah, 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 and I, I don't know what the hell that means. I don't, I don't know what it means. My experience of our sector is that structural inequality has given us so much, so little experience about how to negotiate the main space that, that, 
that I don't know what building, what rebuilding really means in concrete terms. I don't know, I don't know what equipment or what the tools or how we're being, what tools we're giving ourselves apart from um, a, a, uh, a, an articulation of burn it down and start again. I don't understand. And, and, and I leave it with this, that if we're burning it down, you know, we've got to burn down capitalism. You can't just burn down the sector because none of all of us work on a net deficit um, environment. We're all subsidized by tax. So the moment we start saying burn it down, tell me how you're economically surviving. Tell me, say, let's get rid of the old audiences. Tell me how you're going to balance your books when we've all our theaters have been sleepwalked into having alternative income streams and philanthropy in order to survive. Tell me how you're going to attract artists in when television is paying 50 billion times more and you don't even know if you can get stuff on your stage. Tell me about the ghettoization of work. I hear a lot of bonnet down, bonnet down, bonnet down. And I don't hear enough of, here are the tools that are, we are going to use to replace. Or a historical analysis that tells me that every revolution dies two times before it stands on its feet. So how are you negotiating your way through that you may want to burn it down, but the next gen directly after you will burn down what you've built? Burn it down thing's really interesting because I hope that's not what it sounded like I was saying because that's not what I was saying. What, I'm, what I was trying to say was that I think it's about hearing voice. I, that what now I'm really interested in hearing voices and hearing, hearing opinion, and it's opinions and voices as we come back, because we there is, and I completely agree with you, the tools for rebuilding, what are the tools in when we're sitting in a space where we don't know what tomorrow brings. But in terms of, I'm, I'm personally am interested in that, getting as many voices into the conversation as possible. Don't know how to do that, so that when we do come back, there is a change. Because we know that, as you said, the structural changes, there's structure things that we need to talk about in the way capitalism works. So I'm just interested in that conversation and how it moves forward. Kwame, yeah, absolutely. How are you gonna how are you gonna burn it down? Yes, there is a lot of kind of talk out there about burn it down. And I, I'm always I was gonna say, you know, when we burn it down, we must be also aware that we are under the thing we might be burning down. So we are gonna burn it down. Let's have a plan. That's my thing. I also think it's quite interesting because what for me is quite amazing. I've been in so many Zoom talks recently, and I just sit here and look at hold them. So there's Bollahan, there's Kwame, there's Lynette, there's Roy, there's Matt. I mean, so that this is an interesting time, never in my uh, ex lifetime in the arts have I been surrounded by so many uh, black ADs or people in, you know, who are running companies or, or, or buildings. So on one level, you know, we are going to be effecting some change. Now the measure of that, absolutely. How big, to what degree, <clears throat> to be found out, to be found out. But I do sense that, you know, this might be a time because I, yeah, I just think that there is a power. Now, that power might not be at a certain level yet, but I, I sense it's on the rise. We do have to be aware of how it's used. I agree. We do have to understand what structures we are operating in. You know, for if you kind of zoom out and have to look down, we have to understand that. So we don't necessarily run around and say, yeah, burn it down, burn down everything. We have, we have an understanding of the, you know, the structures we operate in but also what we are trying to do together. And it might take time, we might, you know, we might be at a beginning or very early on, you know, we might be grassroots here. But I think, uh, I think it's good to look around and see, right, who's in this conversation. Because I've been in other Zoom conversations that don't look like, some, like this one, for instance. And I think that's quite interesting. Um, but I also think it's a time of, like Kwame, I agree, like understanding what's gone before, understanding how, revolutions happen how change happens absolutely absolutely we've got to be um uh, what's the word i'm looking for it's we have to have a greater understanding beyond just running arts organizations we have to understand politics finance re religious structures we have to understand so much more than i want to put a show on or get this artist work on which is great because that's what we want to do we want to enable artists to come through our organizations and go out you know, into the industry and, and to, and to uh, make work and to have effect. But you're right, as leaders, I think there is, there is something that we have to be aware of and that is the, truly the bigger picture of what we're in. And I think that's the kind of thing that maybe you're, you're also uh, referring to Kwame, that we have to be, yeah, aware of. I, I have an offering in, in terms of reframing and my interpretation of burn it down. 
um, which is um, to a certain extent what Mike has spoken about, which is the fact that we're in here having a conversation. There's no, there supposedly is a structure that says, oh, they, we can't um, collaborate. Mm -hmm. and, and actually moving forward, we should be collaborating more as much as also, um, you know, kind of leaning more towards the heart of us as a community, as much as also the heart of us in terms of uh, how we want to, as Lynette has said, you know, interact with our communities and look after their interests as much as also heal and provide opportunities for freelancers or, you know, um, potential kind of career um, development or career opportunities that, you know, is a, based on apprenticeships for the younger generations who are looking to explore theatre. That's how we bun it down and reframe and, and reshape exactly what we're trying to do, rather than let's tear up Babylon, you know? In this position, it is revolutionary that there are so many black artistic directors. And I suppose in this moment of lockdown, for me, it was a reset. It was a personal reset and the time to focus on my business and get things right. So for yourselves, in the position that things are different, where there are more of you in this space, you do have this um, weight of responsibility, not regardless of what it is, you're in a senior position and you're looking after the future of your bubble of theatre. What kind of personal goals or decisions or improvements or, or reckonings did you have during lockdown that is preparing you for the next step of whatever the future holds for theatre and for you yourselves in the position that you are, um, being that you are beacons of light for lots of young black creatives who are like, oh wow, okay, got some people that look like me in this space and things could potentially be changing. Michael first. Wow. Um, I think what I felt in this is that, and it's a, such a cliche, but in every um, misfortune, or disaster, there is opportunity. And what I have found in this is that there's two things for me personally, and it might be slightly divorced from me as a dear Tallow Theatre Company. But there was a moment where I was able to stop. Literally, I had to because everything had stopped. And in that moment, just little things, I thought, God, I can do that. I can, I can eat my food without rushing to go somewhere else. And it might seem really simple, but I realized that for years, my life was get up in the morning, eat your food quickly, get the kids to school quickly, get on the train, get lunch quickly, eat it quickly, have meetings quickly, get back on the train, get back home, to get back to sleep, to wake up tomorrow morning, to do it again quickly. And I just thought, actually, I'm not, I feel like I don't want to do that anymore. I think I want to utilize the space that lockdowns give us. I think I want to utilize the opportunity that comes from all this connectivity. I swear, I was in the first Zoom meeting. Kwame was there. Uh, Bolahan, I think you were there. Lynette, I think you might have been there. There were so many of us. And I just went, wow. Wow. If one third of the people in this Zoom meeting hook up and start doing stuff, we got change. If what, just one third of them, you know, it's not possible, I think, all the time to take everybody with you all the same time. It's hard. It's ideal, but it's hard. If a third of the people, in that Zoom meeting, kind of going, let's get together and do some stuff. That would be amazing. And I think that's the thing I take away. I think in, in terms of running Tallow Theatre Company, I, I think, look at this. Let's, let me talk to Brixton, Bush, Young Vic on the Zoom now. I've got an idea. Yeah, no, no. Okay, cool. I'll come back with another one. I've got one. You can do it. And I think that's been like at any, at more than any other time has made me kind of go, all right. That's, that's a new way for me. And it's not dependent. It's dependent on people who kind of feel like I feel. It's just whether the time is right or, you know, the thing is in tune. And I think that's one of the learning things I've taken away. Slowing down, time for thought, connectivity, and exactly how many of us literally are out here in these positions with power. We, are, we have our own power. And I, I kind of like that. Tweaking just to the end, some British black productions that you're excited about or stories that you're excited about, because I think it's important that we recognise our stories are coming to the forefront and they're asking for our stories. Um, you've already been delivering them, of course, but something that you're excited about that's coming up, and that's for everybody as well when I get round to you. 
get round to you. From my own, from Talawa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talo was doing this thing called Tales from the Frontline. And it's, like I said, it's the kind of uh, testimonies, experiences of black key workers during this time of COVID. What's interesting is that, and I've said this in the press releases as well, so if we weren't in this pandemic, we would be dealing with Brexit and we would be dealing with the Windrush scandal. Yeah, we would be walking down the road and seeing flipping posters legitimizing kind of racist attitudes like immigrants go oh that's that's what we're looking at covid comes along lays bare the fact that the very people that the host nation is wanting to get out are the very people who are propping the flipping country up now what we do what i would like is that those those stories these stories we're going to tell are going to be recorded and remembered so that when it, in 10 20 30 years time when they talk about oh yeah do you remember 2020 what a crazy year you know, and COVID, and you see a picture of frontline or hear stories, we're in that story. And that's important for me, and I'm very excited. And I've heard a few of these um, recordings, uh, they're, they're very moving and, and very funny. So I look forward to putting that together as a, as a kind of cultural offering from Talos Yes, a company. I think, um, just so I don't forget, and also I feel like in in some ways it's a metaphor for what we want to do is kind of I'm, I'm excited about small acts and i think that's what bricks and house want to be do you know what i mean in terms of just looking at structural inequalities as much as also um bringing uh, the narratives of the underdog uh, as much as also um, the work that's already been done on, um, in grassroots kind of organization and social enterprises to the fore and supporting them as much as we can. And, and, and I guess moving forward, uh, you know, one of the things that we're exploring is how to um, respond, uh, celebrate, reflect, as much as also be galvanized and empowered by um, the 40th year anniversary of the Brixton riots. So that's something that we're kind of exploring currently. Um, I feel like I have learned so much about myself in the last 600 years. I swear, man. And I'm calling it 600 years because it feels like, are we swearing? We are in it. Kwame swore. It feels I like, he's <laughs> it. It feels like fucking 600 years, man. It is, we've gone, I feel like I've gone through some massive i don't even know boy but i'm a different person <laughs> and it's all i can say it's been devastating it's been hard there's been moments of joy and finding the pockets of joy have been important i echo what michael said about this and and also being able to reach out to people and have that feeling of community even though it's through this has been so important um, and i've spoken to people that i've never spoken to before and, and i've connected with people that i've never connected with before the, the moment to stop was really important for me. I had, um, I've been at the bush for a year, literally it was a year when the pandemic started and I hadn't stopped again. And for me, it was always art, 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 as it is for all of us. But I'm really struck by what Michael, someone said, I think it was you, Michael, about, I've learned so much about politics. I knew, I know about politics. It's always been my thing, but you know, I've spent a lot of time with Kwame uh, and a lot of other leaders and just, thinking about politics in a way that, that I had never thought about before and actually how art and what art is in that conversation is really interesting to me and, and learning that. Um, and <laughs> you know what, it's just reiterated to me how much I, 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 I fucking love theatre, man. I fucking miss it. I miss it. I miss being with people and I'm sad. And the, the, for me, opening the building is the thing that I'm desperate to do and have been desperate to do is to bring people safely. And obviously COVID just put it there for a second, just having people together is, is, how, is how we heal. And that's been really hard, but we haven't been able to do that. Um, so yeah, loads of stuff. I feel like I've come on the biggest journey and I feel like a stronger woman. And um, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm, we're getting through it. Woo! Um, but <laughs> what am I looking forward to? I'm really looking forward to some of the stuff the Bush has got planned um, over the next month with our community. We're hopefully going to run a summer scheme for young people who've had limited access to Wi-Fi and get them in the building. We're hopefully going to be supporting some of our elder communities by doing um, packages and stuff like that. And I think that that for me, that's also what the, that's what the work is about. And um, I'm really excited that we're able to do that work. This time last year, um, I was 
I, I was amid a, I, I was amid a scandal that threatened, or in its attempt to 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 take me out, right? And uh, like literally right now, my building was being um, vandalized, my staff was being threatened, my I was being uh, racially abused, and um, in, a, in a in a in a high tech um, in a high tech what else? Uh, in a high tech fashion, and um, you know. I listened, there was a song that I listened to throughout that time. And it was, when shit hits the fan, are you still a fan? Kendrick Lamar. That is a banger. Right? When shit hits the fan, are you still a fan? And, uh, and that, that carried me. It meant I looked at people differently post that attack. I was like, when shit, my shit hit the fan. Were you still a fan? Did you give me the benefit of the doubt? Did you run your mouth when you didn't know the facts? When shit hit the fan, are you still a fan? And so when I've gone through this COVID thing, COVID was like, okay, well, we just did that run and here comes another one. And what survival tactics do we use to survive this? How do you survive a thing that was not of your making, but affects you profoundly? You listen, you pray, you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, am I doing everything that I can do? Am I looking after my people? Am I looking after me? Am I looking after my sector? And once that, once you, can, once you can look at yourself in the mirror and do that, then you go, well, then I win. That's, that's my training ground. My training ground for what we're going through now was what happened to me last year. And our, my strategy with our government when doing politics was Kendrick Lamar. You don't like to boast about us when you're out of the country here, yeah, saying, yeah, we're from the land of Shakespeare and theater and look how great our diversity is. But when shit hits the fan, are you still a fan? Are you gonna help us or not? So that's been my, my learning throughout this, has simply been find a thing that can drive, help you drive through this. And that's been for me, Brother Kendrick. Excited product products your projects you're excited yeah, about. We're gonna do an external. Uh, we're gonna do you know we didn't know until today that we could open the building if we could do social distancing. So we're prepared for uh, for a big instant art installation on the outside of our building sometime in uh, in in August September. Um, and I, I think it's gonna jump into the, a lot of the shit that we that we've been talking that the country has been talking about. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you so much, guys. I'd like to end with Hannah because um, she's, like I said, an avid theatre goer. Uh, she's our new theatre writer. And I just think the future of theatre as it stands from my perspective, what are your thoughts, Hannah, on what everyone said? Um, Criticise them all. <laughs> but just actually, what are your maybe hopes and dreams and wishes for the theatre as someone who's an avid theatre goer and you review theatre? What are your hopes and dreams I would say. I mean yeah I think that we we covered kind of the 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 worries that we have for the future of the theatre but I think I mean from someone who isn't an artistic director I think I can only be positive about it if I want to go into this industry in any way and I think for me, the things I found so exciting about theatre during this time, like you've all said, is the the way that people have responded in their creativity. I think, like, I, I wasn't aware of um, Brixton House so much as a theatre before lockdown, but having this extra time to actually bother to find these smaller theatres rather than just going to the national because it's easiest to get emails from or whatever and then seeing all these new artists like Coco Brown uh, I think 
seeing seeing people really respond to what was happening at the current moment it was so powerful to me watching the the protest i think that's definitely been the highlight for me of the theater that's been created during this time because for me uh, i think like everyone who's interested in theater it's th the power that art has to respond and make sense of what's going on at any current moment and i think that obviously that's that's a lot more difficult right now but seeing how people could still be creative during this moment reminded me of why I would want to go into this sector and why I love it so much, even if we're going to have to be a lot more innovative uh, for it to survive. So yeah, thank you everyone. Guys, I just want to say thank you for your time and for